Aloha Aina, and welcome to Voices of Truth One-on-One -on -one with Hawaii's Future, brought to you by the Kiwani Foundation. I'm at Huke Kahu Cardwell, and here we are today in Thomas Square in Honolulu on the island of Oahu, and I'm going to tell you this right now, we have a fascinating guest on the show, so let's go on over here and meet him. Baron, aloha, Baron Kahaola Ching, did I say your name right? Hololeh. Wonderful. And we're in Thomas Square today, yes? Yes. Well, actually, this whole area, before it was Thomas Square, was a place called Kula Okahua, which was actually a big plains going between uh, Nuuana Street and all the way over to the base of the, the, the taro patches in Waikiki. So this was Kula Okahua. It was actually just a big piece of uh, desert out here in the country. So that was its original name here, yeah? Kula Okahua, the whole area over here. Okay, but at some point in some time, many, many years ago, this was renamed Thomas Square. Specifically this area, and in fact, that was the most prominent part of Kula Okahua, and that's where its fame came from. Baron, why is this called Thomas Square? Well, the event started in 1843. The British consul to Hawaii, a guy named Charlton, was that used a piece of property by High Chief Kalaimoku down by Honolulu Harbor. So the problem was that Kalaimoku didn't own the place and it belonged to somebody else. Uh oh. And so basically they took him to court and they said, no, you can't, you can't do this over here. This is not your property. You can't develop it. So Charlton did what you know any other civilized member of a great uh, kingdom would do. He wrote a letter to the Admiralty and he demanded that the British fleet come and do something about it. And so what happened was that on February 20th, 1843, the Right Honorable Lord George Paulette, Captain in the Royal British Royal Navy, drops anchor in Honolulu Harbor, and he demands an audience with the king. He says, you know, you guys have been unfair to the British citizens over here, and we demand that anything that happens over here go through the British legal system. Those were the unfair laws. Kaui Keauli was not here. That's Kamehameha the third. Kamehameha the yeah. third. He was in Lahaina, and he gets his note from uh, Paulette. And so it's like, well, you know, you're having a problem with me and your counsel. He says, well, talk to my, you know, my foreign minister, Judd, and, you know, we'll straighten this all out. It's kind of like, well, you know, if somebody steals the uh, uh, Swedish ambassador's Volvo in London, you know, you don't send a Swedish warship up the Thames, drop anchor in front of Buckingham Palace and demand an audience with the Queen, you know, the captain of the Swedish warship. No, your consul talks to your consul, done. Problem is fixed, everybody is happy, right? Mm -hmm. But um, Paulette says, no, I'm not talking to Judd. He's, he's a crook just like the rest of you, and I want to talk with you. And of course, you know, Kaui Keaul is kind of like nonplussed by this. It's kind of like, well, why am I talking to this rogue British sea captain? Why do I need to talk to this guy? So what he does is says, Essentially, right, so they're saying, well, you know, I'm kind of busy with the affairs of state, and I'll get back to you when I get back to you. And so, so you know, Paulette is left in Honolulu Harbor cooling his heels. And so, you know, nothing is happening, right? He's not going to get this interview with, um, with Koei Keauli, but what happens is he finally gets really tired of this. And so on February 24th or so, 1843, he sends another letter to Koei Keauli. He says, you know what, if you don't talk to me, I'm going to level my guns on Honolulu. And it's like, whoa, you know, the kingdom is neutral. It doesn't take sides. The kingdom has no army. You have the cops and you have the Royal Guard, but you're not going to take on the British Empire. I mean, these guys just 50 years ago demolished the greatest military force in the world, the combined Spanish French Armada. I mean, they demolished these guys. You're not going to take on the British Empire, not over something like this. On the other hand, he still wasn't going to talk with Paulette. So he sends him another note saying, you know what, I'm not going to talk with you, but don't demolish Honolulu. I am going to surrender my sovereignty temporarily, but not to you. I'm going to surrender my sovereignty to London until they straighten you guys out. And so February 24th, 1843, Paulette lands, takes down all the Hawaiian flags and burns them, puts up the British flag, he declares Hawaii to be British territory. The news of this takes a while to get to um, the British squadron command in the Pacific. And the commander of that fleet is Rear Admiral Richard Thomas, who is 
station in Valparaiso, Chile. So he hears about this and he says, uh oh, this is not right. So he jumps on a sailboat and he flies to Honolulu as fast as he can, drops anchor in Honolulu Harbor on July 25th and he requests an audience with Kamehameha III. And Kamehameha III generously grants this visit. This is to Admiral Thomas. Yes. Uh huh. And Admiral Thomas hears of this and he says, you know, this is incredible. He says, civilized nations do not attack other nations. So he says, okay, we're going to make this right, but we have to do this with ceremony. So what happens is that he sets the date to be July 31st of that year, 1843. And what happens is that uh, he assembles the Royal Marines out in the country. And uh, at 9.30 in the morning, Kawikea Uli, his entourage, and Admiral Thomas leave town and they arrive about 10 o'clock in Thomas Square where this place is. Right here? Yeah, right here. And what happens is that they ceremonially transfer uh, sovereignty back to Kauikea Uli. To the Hawaiian Kingdom government. Yep, and ceremonially they raise the Hawaiian flag. Now there's all kinds of accounts about where this happened. There was one account that says, yes, it was here. They lower the British flag, put up the Hawaiian flag. Other accounts say that it was at Honolulu Fort uh -huh. And it was also on the top of Punchbowl. I mean, you can't see Punchbowl right now, but uh, Punchbowl was a Hawaiian Kingdom military installation. Mm -hmm. And from the top of Punchbowl, you raise that flag, and it can be seen all the way from you know, Waikiki all the way to where the airport is now. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew that this was happening. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the places where it happened. But it was Honolulu Fort, uh, Punchbowl, and also, I think, over here. So three places at once. Yes. Wow. Kaui Keauli and his entourage leave shortly after that, and they go back to town. And from the steps of Kauai Ha'o, he gives a speech where part of that is Uomau Ke'eo Ka'aini Kapono, which turns into the, the motto of the kingdom, uh, the territory, and the state, interpreted as the life of the land is preserved in righteousness. Yeah. But he did not say Uomau ke ola o ka aina He said right. Uomau ke ea o ka aina Ea to the ancestors was one and the same. You could not have um, life. You couldn't have breath unless you had sovereignty. And that's mm. how they thought. Mm. So what he was really saying is the sovereignty of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. Yes. yes. Totally different meaning. Kaui Keuli declares this to be a public park. But see, in those days, I mean, this is this big plot of grass, right? Nobody knows where it is. And you know, why declare it a park? You know, it's a big park to begin with, you know? Right. It wasn't until like five or six years later where the Privy Council actually got together and said, okay, okay, we're officially designating this as a park. And of course, back then, see, this place was just a big dusty plain, there was no water. And so you really couldn't do a whole bunch with it. Things started changing uh, when they put in uh, like a reservoir up in Makiki. So they actually tried to truck in some water, and they actually did try to make this place, you know, nice. So at what point did they name it Thomas Square, Barry? Well, actually, I think Kaui Keauli said that this was going to be it, but I think it was officially recognized about 1850. Got it. So it's named Thomas Square after Admiral Richard Thomas, the guy who did this. Uh, that street is over there is Victoria Street, named after Queen Victoria of England, and I think they formalized the name of that street, Britannia, for Britannia. So the history of what occurred, the taking temporarily of the sovereignty of the Hawaiian Kingdom, that history is all around us here. Oh, and yet yes. most people, when they walk through the park or drive down Britannia Street or Victoria Street, they have no idea about that, do they? No, in fact, if you come down to it, they were actually trying to suppress that. Baron, there's a plaque in this park, in Thomas Square Park, yeah? Yes. And what is the plaque about? Okay, I think that's really the only official recognition that was ever done about this. It was put in by the Daughters of Hawaii, I think in the 1930s, it'll be on the plaque. And they finally recognized that, yeah, this is where it happened, La Hoi Hoi, yeah. Wow. So, oh, I see, it's right over here. So it's been on this wall all this time. Since the 1930s or so. But again, something that people walk right by. Yes. And they miss. Yeah, and they really, I think, it's intentional. I don't think they really want people to know. Wow. So why did the, the daughters put that up in 1930? If people w wanted to forget about what happened? No, I'm not even sure. 
I think the daughters mean well. Um, you, you know who the daughters are. Tell us. They're the descendants of the missionaries. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. And surprisingly enough, yeah, they've been doing all the stuff that... Rec oh, but it's because it's the history. And they're big into the history of this mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. But that's the plaque. There it is right there. Look at that. Wow. Amazing. You don't see it so much now, but you see this coral over here? Yes, look at this. Okay. Wow. When this was reconfigured in the 1930s, this was made in the shape of a Union Jack. You had the, the big, park was. Yeah. You had these coral walkways that ran through the center there to the other side. And you had the diagonals, and you can still see to some degree what's left of that coral that ran through there. And so what you have here is actually a Union Jack. So this answers the question about the rumors we've all heard over the years about from the air looking down on Thomas Square, you can see the pattern of a Union Jack flag, yes? And there's even more than that. Okay. Okay, because if you look um, back in the monarchy days, there was actually a, a stamp cancel that looked very much similar to this. And, and it, what, it, what, what it had was a center circle with basically Union Jack surrounded by other circles. And that's how you canceled Hawaiian Kingdom stamps back in the 1880s. And those represent the Union Jack and the Hawaiian flag stripes. If you look in the center over there, you got all these circles. You have the Union Jack, so it's a little bit in the reverse. You have the stripes of the flag in the center, and you have the Union Jack on the outside. But basically, it's a stylized Hawaiian flag. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So the rumors are true. It's true. Baron is the design of the flag, uh, the Hawaii flag. It does it look like the Union Jack because they wanted to prove their uh, alliance or were hoping to solidify their alliance with Britain? Or is that designed because of what occurred here in Thomas Square and it was kind of like a thank you, if you will? No, it was, it was designed well before Thomas Square. To Hawaii, the closest uh, friends they had in this whole world were Britain and the United States. Of course, you know, false trust in the United States. <laughs> we all know what happened out of that. We all know what happened to that. <laughs> but um, they considered the United States and Hawaii uh, and Britain to be their closest friends and allies in the world. And that's why they, I think they made the flag. Well, so then Baron Time rolled on and people began to forget about the history of the park, yes? I don't know that they forgot or it was suppressed. Ah. I think it was more suppression. Okay. You look after the overthrow, and you know it's like like 99% of the people in Hawaii were against annexation, and then they did this thing, this indoctrination into it. They took the schools and they said, "Oh, you're all Americans now. You all have to swear allegiance to the American flag. You're not Hawaiians anymore. You're never going to be independent again." And they made them swear, you know, the the, the pledge of allegiance. They they taught in the school that you're you're uh, history begins with George Washington. <laughs> you know, they don't mention anything about the monarchy. And they actually erased Hawaiian history. Everybody knew what's going on. You know, these guys are crooks. They, 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 they stole the place, right? So it was a badge of honor. You go to jail because you know, you're opposing these guys. Oh, that's cool. Those guys are like a bunch of crooks anyway, right? Even though speaking Hawaiian language, okay, to speak ill of the United States, they interpret as speaking any language besides English. And I, during the First World War, I think it was the Norwegians, they were complaining, saying, you know what, Norway is not at war with the United States. Why are you prohibiting us from speaking Norwegian? And the same thing happened in Hawaii. Now it's a federal rap. You know, you're going to be penalized. Federal law. Back then. If you speak Hawaiian. Wow. Up to that point, again, it's a point of honor. Everybody, everybody spoke Hawaiian. Even the non-Hawaiians spoke Hawaiian. Up to the 1920s, Hawaiian was the language of Hawaii. My grandfather, okay, I could hardly understand him. He spoke Cantonese, spoke really thick pidgin, right? I, I couldn't understand the guy. So one day we're sitting, and I don't speak Cantonese. So one day we're sitting on the night, he says, oh, you know I can speak Hawaiian? Like, oh, I, it didn't strike me then, okay. But he was born, you know, in Hanalei, kingdom of Hawaii in the 1880s. So wait a minute, he was full Chinese blood. Yeah. But he was, a, and he was a Hawaiian Kingdom National. Yes, he was. So that makes you his descendant, a Hawaiian Kingdom National. Yeah, and on my mother's side, my uh, great-grandfather 
but became a naturalized Hawaiian subject in 1891. So both sides of the family wow. Hawaiian nationality. But at any rate, what happens is that um, by the time 1920s roll around, he's like 40 something years old. You know how tough it is to pick up a foreign language when you're 40 years old? <laughs> so he spoke Hawaiian, he spoke Cantonese, and he spoke Pidgin, and he didn't speak English. Wow. That's what most people in Hawaii spoke. They spoke Hawaiian and thick Pidgin. Wow. And they did not speak English. Wow. Baron, you know, how did you begin to come across all this information about Thomas Square and all the other amazing historical facts that you've shared with us today? Well, it actually began with Kikuni Blaisdell when he re, you know, re revitalized La Hoi Hoi Ea back in the 1980s. You know, back then it was a bunch of, you know, true believers. Half dozen people show up. We have an eight foot doll. We put up a Hawaiian state flag, which was the only thing that we had at that time. So you were there. You were one of those eight. Uh, I don't even know. It was such a long time ago. But at any rate, early on I was there. And so um, what happened was that he learned, like, wow, all of this happened. And then... But how did you learn that? From books? Somebody else told you or what? Um, all kinds of various sources. Okay. Uh, miscellaneous. Just like all... Okay, a lot of the history here has been hidden. They don't want people to know this. And you've got to, just little pieces of it kind of like popping up. You know, it's, to me it's just been fascinating. So you kind of like, you have to be kind of like a detective, yeah? And put all the pieces together so you get the picture. Yeah, what happens is that this little enticing piece of information comes up and it's like, whoa, that's interesting. I wonder what that means. So you go look up a little further. Whoa, did this happen over here? And that happened over there? Yeah, this whole place is rich in history. And people don't realize that they think this place, you know, is nothing but asphalt and concrete. But people don't realize how much of a Hawaiian place this is. You know, from, from Mauka to Makai, it's whole Ahupua. It's just rich in history. And it can be sitting on the ground that you're just standing on. You can't believe how much stuff there is here. You know, I could go on for hours about the stuff that's available in this Ahupua, which is not generally known. Mm. And it's not, it's not necessarily hidden. This is nobody wants this stuff known. Wow. So when you begin to discover this stuff, Baron, how did that make you feel? Well, at times I've been angry. <laughs> um, you know, I always thought it was an issue of justice. You know, fighting for the Hawaiians to achieve, you know, what, what really is. They, they don't have a home, really. And it's like, they don't have a home. Well, what can I do to help these guys? Then I found out, hey, I have subjecthood. I'm part of the, the, the fight. You're a Hawaiian Kingdom National. That's right. Yeah. As they say, you have a dog in this fight. Uh huh. And it's like, hey, not only are they just fighting for a bunch of people, it's for our rights too. Hmm. And it's not, I mean, the Hawaiians, you know, they suffer, no doubt about that. But it turns out there's a lot of people in Hawaii who are, are suffering under the American occupation. Hmm. And they just don't realize that. Hmm. You know, you know, back, in 1897, when they, you know, you see, you've seen the play, Kalemaili Ali. One of the arguments was that the United States was bent on becoming a great world power, which means that they were going to get into a lot of wars. And Hawaii was a neutral nation, and we were going to get sucked into these wars if the United, if we were annexed by the United States. And sure enough, look at the Second World War. Did Japan attack Hawaii because he didn't like hula girls or pineapples? Nope. Nope. They attacked Hawaii because of the Pacific Fleet, the greatest navy in the world at that time. They didn't attack Hawaii because of Hawaii. They attacked it because of the U.S. presence here. That's exactly right, the military presence. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that, oh, we're worried about that madman, you know, Kim in North Korea. One of these days he's going to build a rocket that can hit the U.S. people. He has a rocket that can hit Hawaii now. Mm -hmm. Now. Mm -hmm. He's had that for years. But we don't seem to count. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it doesn't matter until they can hit San Francisco. Hit Hawaii, we're expendable. Too bad. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's come down to. Hawaii is nothing more than expendable foreign Real estate. base. Yeah. We're expendable. So the reason the Japanese bombed Hawaii was not because of the Hawaiian kingdom or Hawaiians here. It was because of the presence of U.S. military here, yes? The Pacific Fleet the greatest fleet in the world at that time. And, um, you know, there's a lot of arguments what's going on. And I don't 
argue about the merits or demerits or who was right or who was wrong. All I know is that Hawaii had no fight with the Japanese Empire. Mm. You know, and because of the American presence there, again, we were attacked. We were sucked into that war. They may have been very bad people, but it wasn't our fight. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is happening now with North Korea. Mm -hmm. You know, they're saying, well, okay, they don't have the capacity to hit the West Coast yet. People, this is SYNCPAC, Commander-in-Chief Pacific Forces. This is the command center of the greatest military force in the entire Earth. And they have the capacity to strike this place with the existing hardware that they have right now. North Korea does. Yeah. They're going to nuke Sinkpak. Mm -hmm. That's the island of Oahu. Mm -hmm. If they nuke Oahu, everybody, everything on this island is going to die. Mm -hmm. Everything. They, they, you've seen Puhipau? Mm -hmm. And the first film was Puhipau. Mm -hmm. And they show what happened with, when a, you know, a medium sized nuclear weapon blows up over Pearl Harbor. They said this whole place is going to be wiped out. There's not going to be a single soul alive on the island of Oahu. Now we come to the latest chapter of Thomas Square, which is the city and county of Honolulu wants to transfer the management and ownership of Thomas Square over to another department yes. to do something with it. Tell us about that. They plan to take Thomas Square out of the domain of parks and recreations and put it to enterprise services. Now, if you're, and they're both city departments, but if you're not familiar with enterprise services, they're the ones, guys who run NBC, they run the Shell, uh, they run other uh, profit-making city organizations. So these are money-making entities. Yes, they money. are. Money. Revenue-making yes. entities. And they're saying, oh, well, no, we, we plan to keep Thomas Square as a cultural kind of thing because that's what we do, we're a cultural kind of thing. But it's like, uh, yeah, okay, that's nice. Uh, can you show us? And they can't because they have to propose the rules that the city council has. So they're saying, I mean, you know, Thomas Ulukukui is in charge of, you know, enterprise services. He's a nice man. He's, you know, he's trying to be straight. But the fact of the matter is, he can't promise what the rules are going to be because the city council has to approve it. He's saying, La Hoi Hoi Ea is integral to the you know, to Thomas Square. You cannot have that. But what are the rules? You know, you can't pass any bills out at NBC. You can't do anything political at NBC. Mm. You know. So what does it mean? If, if enterprise services take over the what? We can't do any politicking here? You can't You can't have any Hawaiian National Kingdom holidays. You wonder about that. Yeah. They're saying that they do, but it depends on what city council does because they set the rules for all enterprise services. And the other issue is that his honor, the mayor, early on, he says he envisions this place as a quote, world class, unquote, park. It's like, world class? What happened to like local class? And you're looking at development over here. You got Kaka'ako, you got multi-million dollar condominiums, you got the NBC. You got war, you know, development. I mean, he's talking like this is for rich people, and now he's talking about we're taking this part, which is like the soul of Hawaiian sovereignty, and we're going to make it world class. What does that mean? It means no more Hawaiian sovereignty soul. That means it becomes another tourist site. Yes, for more revenue. Yeah, and they're talking about changes in places. They're talking about oh, they're going to have like these little water, you know, thingies so that the kids can play inside here. They're talking about having a beer garden. They're talking about having oh, wait, bicycle rentals. A beer garden here? Yeah. Okay. All kinds of weird stuff like that. It's like, are you guys kidding? Yeah. You know, this is Thomas Square. Yeah. You know, this yeah. is La Hoi Hoi Ea. This is Hawaiian independence. Yeah. You're going to put all this stuff over here? It sounds like it's another stealth move to cover up the history of what happened here and replace it with more revenue for the city government. Well, who knows? Who knows? I know that we didn't have much of a say in it. I mean, we've, made, we've asked for, requested certain changes. One of the things they, they said, okay, they want to fly a big flagpole and fly Hawaiian flag 24 seven. Okay, cool. They want to put a bandstand in. Cool, okay, that's cool. You know, you know, for all uh, La Hoi Hoi observation over here. Well, that's cool. But this other stuff, we didn't have any say. 
you know, I mean, they're talking about it's like really strange stuff. They're talking about, oh, they're going to build all these statues over here. They're going to have Admiral Thomas. They're going to have Kaori Kiaui. They're going to have you know, all these guys over here. Like, nobody asked us. Yeah, wow. And, and, and the, the statues are going out to bid now, this week. And no input from the community. As far as I know of, no. Yeah, yeah. wow. Uh, Baron, an amazing story. Thank you for sharing the history of Thomas Square with us, as well as the attempts to cover up what happened here, and also the current chapter of Thomas Square that we're going to keep our fingers crossed on and hope it turns out OK. Yeah, we've been keeping an eye on that. Yeah, That's good. Please continue to keep an eye on that. Mahalo for being on Voices of Truth. And to you, our viewers, mahalo to you for joining Baron and me here at, at historic Thomas Square. Remember, you can watch us on the web 24-7 on VoicesOfTruthTV.com, and you can visit Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future on Facebook. I'm Mahu Ke Kahu Cardwell for the Kiwani Foundation, and along with Baron here, until next time, Ahui Ho! Ahui Ho! Mahalo for watching Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future. Watch us on the web 24-7 at VoicesOfTruthTV.com. You'll find all our shows, including this one, in case you want to see it again or share it with family and friends. Also, view our weekly video commentaries at FreeHawaiiTV.com. And check out our blog, published daily, at FreeHawaii.info. It's all part of the Free Hawaii Broadcasting Network.